In this video, I'm going to explore the top five mistakes I see students making when they plan their cross-country flights. Now, I've reviewed flight plans for hundreds of cross-country flights, whether as the primary instructor or as the chief pilot conducting a stage check, and these five mistakes come up regularly. Let's identify them and make suggestions about what to do instead. Oh, by the way, if you struggle to remember all the steps necessary to plan a VFR flight, I've created a checklist you can download for free. The link is in the description below. First mistake often begins with route selection. One of the greatest advantages of flying is the ability to travel directly from point A to point B. But in an effort to practice pilotage and dead reckoning, many students give up that efficiency by designing overly complex or indirect routes. However, using pilotage does not require you to fly directly over each waypoint. In fact, Placing waypoints slightly off to the left or the right, of course, is often better. It allows you to visually confirm your position as you pass them. Spotting a landmark off your right wing followed by another off your left wing helps create a visual corridor, a technique sometimes called bracketing or funneling. This makes it much easier to stay on course without flying directly overhead. Another benefit of straight line routing is in the planning phase, especially if you're planning by hand. Every time your route changes direction, you have to recalculate your true course, your true heading, your magnetic heading, and your ground speed. But if your legs follow the same true course and the winds remain the same, you don't have to recalculate the wind correction angle or the ground speed. The only changes you might have to make would be the magnetic heading if you cross a new isogonic line. For example, if your first leg is on a true course of 219 degrees, you'll calculate a corresponding true heading, magnetic heading, and ground speed. If your next leg is also 219 degrees and the winds haven't changed, your wind correction angle and the ground speed will be the same. But if your course shifts to 225 degrees, you're back to square one and you have to recalculate everything. Once candidates understand this, their plans start taking less time and they look a lot better but they often overlook an equally critical piece of flight planning. The second mistake happens when selecting an altitude. I've reviewed many cross-country plans where when asked about cruise altitude, the student can't explain why they chose it. The most common answer is, that's what my instructor and I use during training. Now, that doesn't necessarily make the choice wrong, but it won't hold up during the oral exam portion of your check ride, and it definitely won't help when flying solo to unfamiliar places. Altitude selection needs to be deliberate and defensible. Yes, you must avoid terrain and obstacles, but sound planning goes way beyond that. A few questions you can ask yourself when choosing an altitude are, what direction am I flying? Follow 14 CFR 91-159 to reduce collision risk. How high can my aircraft safely climb? Will I need oxygen and do I have it on board? Is the flight long enough to justify climbing to that altitude? What winds aloft offer the best performance? Are there restricted or special use areas along the route? And can I fly over, under, or around them? I break altitude selection down in, a, in much more detail in a previous video. I've put the link in the description below. However, the key takeaway today is this. You need to be able to explain and support every altitude decision. Now, you might have the right heading and the right altitude, but are you making mistake number three? Before we discuss number three, don't forget to download the free VFR flight planning checklist. Mistake number three, you might have the perfect route and a solid performance plan, but if something goes wrong and you can't land at your destination, then what? I often see students so focused on optimizing the plan to their primary destination, they forget to prepare for when things don't go according to plan. According to 14 CFR 91-103 Alpha, pilots must have alternatives available if the planned flight cannot be completed. Yet, I've seen students either skip the alternate altogether or list a random airport nearby without much thought as to why it would be a good option. Like altitude selection, alternate airport planning should be intentional. So, what makes a suitable alternate? Well, flight educator David St. George suggests using the 3R rule. This is radar. Pick a towered airport with radar coverage. Restaurant. If you're stuck for a while, you'll have a place to grab something to eat and drink. And rental cars. Make sure there's ground transportation available to get you where you need to be. I'd also recommend considering selecting airports that publish TAFs. 
These are crucial for understanding expected weather conditions and airports that are well out of the path of bad weather, both in distance and direction. Choosing a good alternate is as essential as calculating your heading or checking your fuel. It's not just about regulatory compliance, it's about being prepared. At this point, you may have chosen your airports wisely and even picked a good alternate, but do you have all the necessary information to make safe, legal decisions? Mistake number four is not having the necessary information about destination and alternate airports. A helpful acronym to remember the regulatory minimums under 14 CFR 91.103 is NWCRAFT. This stands for no TAMs, weather, known ATC delays, runway lengths, alternates, fuel requirements, and takeoff and landing distances for the actual day and time of the flight. This last one gets missed a lot. During training flights, many students skip takeoff and landing distance calculations because they or their instructors are already familiar with the airport's layout and aircraft performance under typical conditions. But what happens when the conditions aren't typical? For example, the temperatures are significantly higher, the runway is shorter due to construction, or there's a higher density altitude. I recommend making it a habit to calculate takeoff and landing performance for every flight, not just when conditions seem challenging. But don't stop there. Take an extra moment to review the airport diagram and identify a physical landmark on the runway that can serve as your go, no-go point. Is there a taxiway intersection, a crossing runway, something you can easily see from the cockpit? Now, ask yourself, what's my plan if I reach that point and I'm not airborne or not safely on the ground? Thinking through that decision before you start the engine is far easier and far safer than trying to figure out in real time when the stakes are high. Beyond what's listed in 14 CFR 91.103, there's other essential information that every pilot should know. Traffic patterns. Are any runways right traffic? Many students miss this, especially when the winds shift or they have to divert to an unfamiliar field. And then frequencies. In our region, most airports use a separate comm frequency for CTAF and for weather, but a few still broadcast weather over VOR frequencies. If you don't know which radio to use, you could waste valuable time trying to figure out why you can't tune in that silly weather frequency. <laughs> now, on to the last of our five mistakes. Mistake number five is not truly understanding or applying fuel reserve requirements. Now, most students can quote 14 CFR 91.151 from memory. For day VFR, you need enough fuel to reach your destination plus 30 minutes at normal cruise. For night VFR, it's 45 minutes. This is a really good start, but quoting the rule isn't the same as applying it in a meaningful way. If I ask the question a little differently, for example, at the power setting you're planning to use, how many gallons of reserve fuel do you need? Many students hesitate. Without translating that time-based requirement into an actual fuel quantity, it's hard to know whether you're truly covered. And here's the bigger issue. Even if you meet the legal minimum reserves, will it actually be enough? Let's say your alternate airport is 65 nautical miles away due to weather, terrain, or lack of nearby options. Will your reserves carry you that far and allow you to land safely with fuel still in the tanks? If not, what's your plan? You might know the regulation and plan accordingly, but if you haven't run the numbers and assessed whether your fuel reserve is practically sufficient, your plan may fall short when you need it the most. The bottom line with all of these situations is that flight planning isn't just about drawing lines on a chart or following the regulations. It's ultimately about making informed and thoughtful decisions that keep you legal, safe, and confident in the air. Hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, please hit the thumbs up and consider subscribing. If you'd like to see more information about planning by hand, watch this video next. <laughs> Don't forget to use the link in the description to download your free cross-country flight planning checklist. And as always, thank you for watching, fly safely, and I will see you next time.